Is your head the attendance sheet?
into the class. So if I post them ahead of time, yeah, if I post them ahead of time, you guys got to read them. If I don't, then you're solid. Okay. Do you have a panic moment there? Well, it says hopefully, because um, I planned out that up and then I didn't, so I put two readings up there that I think you guys will definitely want to reference. You're not going to be quizzed on them. For what that's worth. Oh, perfect, yeah. Okay. okay. Did you submit this online as well? You did? Okay. No, no, no. I can do it. I just wanted to give everyone kind of an option. Thank you, Hey. I'll send this guy around again. I don't think that's why I made the rounds. Okay. Horse notes. Thank you. Shit, there's... So, who use these guys for? No. Um, kind of the, the nice... Good and bad. And if you long hair. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay. With my system here. Oh, Matt, you're in a code profile. We're actually a stylist. Which is pretty cool. Um, let me think out loud. I have to go. I'll never get out of this place today. 
Yes, here on this line. It's, here. It's here. Gotcha. And you can do highlighter, da 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 da. The key is that if I write on it. Sunlight. I'm just getting my entire desk. Slide forward and touch the arrow. Yeah. And otherwise, I'm just like. And it, the thing is, if you're going to use it from my in such a way where it would be nice to have those notes, right. I don't know. Yeah. No, I doubt it. But if you did, so we can save this to like a PDF back. <laughs> if I didn't tell you ahead of time, it's not practical. <laughs> okay. Then we get like an hour a week. Yeah, these are foundation notes. I didn't. Oh, it says it's kind of like. Yeah, I didn't. Smells good. Messing up my system right now. Sour. Okay, I'm gonna shoot to try to be done with the first section in 30 minutes. Right, so I plan. Okay. And then I'll take 10 of the app level max. Okay. I can stretch it out. I didn't get Google Earth up here, so I'm just gonna. Yeah, and then back to our homework. Okay. Sure. All right, guys. How we doing? How did the concept note go? Well, I think... Ish? Ish. Okay. I had I, a couple different fo people write and ask what the difference between intended outcomes and project deliverables would be. Um, there's a fuzzy line there. So I'm not going to be particular about how you define or don't define something coming in. It's more about just thinking, what is it that you want to provide with whatever it is that you're proposing to do? So. And from everyone that's turned it in so far, looks like you guys are right on track. Um, and if you weren't, you heard from me already. So that looked good. Um, how did tracing load path stuff go? <laughs> Is that pretty hard? It was just a little ambiguous in some parts, some assumptions we should make or not make. OK. Um, relative to going with code or relative to just how you distribute the load back? Um. The code, I had a little issue with like which edition we should use, but decided to use the more recent one. And then, I guess, assuming the angles were the same on either side, do you do that for the last two? Or with the homework? Last two, so like. If you calculate the angle out, it's different than, say, like the anchor angle in the drawing. Ah, so on the survey. I mm -hmm. just assumed they're both equal. Yeah, so that's a good assumption. Well, that's a nice thing about pretty much all the assignments here is it's going to be evaluated on your thought process. So if you really get something wrong in the beginning on the homework, the only part you're taking off is the thought process in the beginning was wrong, but how your thought process to the end is okay. The reason that we're having you do this now is when you come back and you do it on the term project, you're essentially going to be replicating this exercise as a, the first step in your term project. In your term project, you have to get it right for good reason. So within each assignment, you guys, it's more about making sure your brain is starting to move in that function and in that process. And um, I will post, um, well, it depends how it goes, but if everyone's really far off, I will post a solution. Sound OK? All right, awesome. OK, so today, um, I actually am going to start with something a little bit off topic. Um, we got a call from the USGS which is the um, geological survey based out of Golden Boulder here. And they have a bridge site that they, they Google searched our class and were like, oh, perfect, you guys could build this bridge. Wouldn't that just be awesome? Um, so although that's not going to be the outcome of this class, I did entertain the thought and speak with the gentleman who works there. And I think what we're going to do is we're going to offer two term project alternatives. One is designing for Bolivia in the site of Chakicocha, and one is going to be designing, putting together an RFP for here in Boulder County. Um, the cool thing about this, and the reason that I, I'm, I think some of you might be interested, is the end benefit is that they're going to put together a proposal and potentially have some funding. So they'll still have to put it through a professional engineer. They're still going to have to hire a company and have drawings stamped and all of those good things. But um, depending on how a group or two groups if they decide to pick this up, it could really be that first potential information that would go into an RFI going back out into a company bid. So really cool application. Tell you a little bit about it. And you don't have to commit with you and your partner until the 29th. 
which is a Saturday. Um, we're going to take a little field trip, which is can't be mandatory. But if you want to do this project as your focus, um, I believe it's about an hour, hour and a half drive out of Boulder. So we'll leave from campus at 9 a.m. on the 29th. And um, I don't have specific details as to exactly how to get there, so I can't tell you yet. But it's on the, right near the Rocky Mountain Hydraulic Research Center, which apparently is a nonprofit organization which promotes scientific research and has had a bridge there previously, um, which ended up having to be taken out. So it was a vehicle, at one point it was a pedestrian bridge, they changed it to a vehicle bridge. Let's look at this guy. Yeah, so at one point it was a vehicle bridge, um, but as you can see that it was uh, timber planks. Those were stripped out, the whole structure was taken down. They put a footbridge in, um, which also has since been taken out. And what's on the other side is this shop, this classroom and bunkhouse. I have the, the GPS coordinates and I meant to open Google Earth, but I don't have it loaded on this machine. So we'll skip that. Um, but if you're interested, what I'd ask is you and your partner kind of talk about it. And I'll send you and your partner specifically more information, i.e. this PowerPoint. And I'm going to take uh, kind of a pulse next week in class who's interested in going, because it's going to be that coming Saturday. If you're really interested in doing this type, this project alternative and you're not available that Saturday, um, we'll talk about it. But there will be a little bit of additional work because you're going to have to physically be the ones doing the survey. So pay attention to Matt today. Which brings me full circle. Matthew Curtis is with Flatiron Construction and he's going to help me on the um, surveying portion of the class. We are shooting to go through kind of the technical site uh, evaluation in this first half hour we'll go pretty quick a lot of the information I'm referencing is coming straight from dang it uh, straight from the bridges to prosperity material so you'll see I'll breeze through some of this um, if you are going to go out onto a site and actually decide whether or not you want to do a bridge I think you need to spend a lot more time than I'm going to address here today Matt's going to finish up or go through the survey process all the different survey methods, um, give you guys kind of a little bit of context of what would be practical in the developing world versus here in the States. Um, I'll do a little bit of an overview of an ABNY level because that's referenced both in your textbook and in any time you do a development project, everyone talks about ABNY levels. These very cool little things. Then we're going to go outside. So by the end of today, we will have all been outside, had our hands on automatic level, We'll do a profile and hopefully still close out by about 10 to 5. Sound good? Awesome. Okay, so the first section, um, this is loaded on the website as 4A. It is evaluating potential crossing sites. We're going to address very basic hydrologic conditions and soil and geotech considerations. As we get into the site, technical site um, feasibility, most everything you're going to ever happen to a bridge has to do with a, choosing the wrong site. So you're not going to have a structural failure, or very, very, very unlikely that you're going to have a structural failure that causes your bridge to fall because you underdesigned something. You're going to have some sort of hydrologic condition, some sort of missed assumption, or oversight in terms of what is your soil or what is your rock, and that's going to cause your bridge to fail. And that's very important to realize from moment number one. When you first show up to a community, we're in Bolivia. We're talking about Charqui Cocha. You are the program manager. You've gone to 47 sites in order to get it down to three actual bridges. So the time you guys are writing your concept note, you've already done a whole lot of work. You've already narrowed it down from 47 to three. The reality is that you've also done 27 community and preliminary site surveys. As all things, there's kind of a logic sequence that kind of comes with this. Is the community willing to participate? Are they willing to donate their labor? Is it technically viable? Do we have erosion? Do we have high flood that's not going to be something you can design around? Are there local materials? Are there local partners? And is it constructible? Is there a dry enough season to actually build a bridge? If you hit no at any point in that thought process, 
you have to go back and reconsider what is your approach. It doesn't mean you can't build a bridge there, but there is a sequence to it, and way more often than not, it's not straightforward. You don't just show up and build a bridge wherever you think, oh, river, bridge, they go hand in hand, you know. Um, but the first thing to really do when you show up in a community, if you want to make sure that your project is a success 10 years down the road, let alone just throughout construction, is to do a full stakeholder participation analysis. So what is a community's role? What is local government expected to do or what role should they play? And are there local partners or other agencies that are going to be mobilized in order for make your, to make your project a success? You need to have a community needs assessment. Again, a river doesn't necessarily mean you need a bridge. What is that bridge going to provide access to? How many people is it going to provide access to? What is the severity of that isolation? So a quick th kind of mind game, just for a second. I've got two bridge scenarios. One is in El Salvador, outside um, El Trunco, and there's going to be 15,000 people that it services. Caveat is that the alternative is a half hour walk. Now we're in, um, we're in Rwanda, and there's a bridge that's going to service 1,500 people. But there is no alternative. Which one would you build and why? Rwanda, I feel like. Rwanda? Yeah. Why? The need is greater. I mean, you're 1,500, like, without alternative is, I think, weighted higher, despite the fact that it's a lower number. Definitely agree with that. Mike? I, I would say, um, I'll be, I would agree with her, of course, but um, I would say um, also in the, in the, the once say it's 15,000, um, I would think that, you know, with, with that large of a community, they would be rather self-sufficient, unless there's something they really need to get to over the bridge, that there's not as a great a need, I guess, I would assume than in the, the other scenario where they just have no alternative. Maybe there's, there's resources or some other social need to get to that, that side. Yep, that's true. There is, tends to be more resources and oftentimes more funding in a larger community. Any other thoughts? Most of the time, they have to walk anyway. 30 minutes isn't that far. I mean, if you're going to yeah. build a bridge, you're going to have to walk 30 minutes to get to the other side of town anyway. Yep, that's a good point. What is their existing requirement for transportation? Well, the interesting thing is, going back to week one, is that the way that the World Bank and the UN justify project need is on a per capita increased income basis. So if you think about the number of projects that are built in a peri-urban area, so in a slum outside of Nairobi, you could have tens and tens of thousands of people that need a bridge that have another alternative. And the UN every time is going to prioritize that project because you're going to service more people for the dollar amount it takes you to build that piece of infrastructure. And at Bridges, we haven't really figured it out. What is that balance point? I mean, we just built a 160-meter bridge in Bolivia, which is an expensive, expensive project. Um, and it serviced maybe 50 families. But... Like Casey alluded to, those 50 families had no other alternative. So when you're doing projects, I think about, um, I personally ask myself, what is the net benefit here? Is this project cost value added? And not just on the UN's, you know, here's how much things should cost per person. So anyway, um, we also, the next step is that that community must request a bridge. There's enough communities, we're in a position where I don't go chasing tails. A lot of projects you do. You don't maybe have the reputation or maybe you just don't have the longevity in a community. But if you're going to build a hospital, if you're going to build a school, and you have some, some variety of places you could work in, making it a prestigious and competitive process is in your best interest. It makes people feel like, oh, I, I won the lottery. I should, you know, I should participate. Um, and we've seen that over and over and over again. If you don't have some community participation and some ownership and some request, you're going to have a more difficult time getting their participation down the road. 
And from the very beginning, having a system of leadership that you are communicating with. We call it a bridge user committee. It could just be a leadership council. But there's some entity with whom you are liaising with before you even decide you're going to do a technical survey. If there's no one here that's willing to work with me, and he's going to organize labor, I don't even want to look at the bridge. Ask the community for needs assessment. Yep, Valentin. Basically, you said that any community who wants a bridge or who needs a bridge needs to fill in a, a request form mm. to get a bridge? Well, so it's not like we just have a mountain cyberspace. We're working in a municipality, so we're working in Cochabamba, and we work with all the regional engineers. So the regional engineers that already work in all the provincial and all of the local communities, they know this is our system. But isn't it completely paradoxical to what we said that we should adapt ourselves to their culture? So, I mean... It's a very good point, yeah. So how do we fight that? I don't know. Yeah, it's a great point. If there was a better way to do it, we would, and we're certainly open to ideas, but the reality is we, we built 31 bridges last year, so there's, for a small organization, there are better ways to do the community development than we do it, much better ways, but it's a very good point. Community needs data, who's going to be crossing this, are there goods that are going to be transported over the bridge as well? Or is it just something that's purely for getting back and forth to school, which is so important? And if that all kind of checks out and you say, yeah, this is going to hit through phase one, you go into the technical feasibility. So there's two different types of bridges, as we've talked about, and they need two different types of terrains. This particular site would be well equipped for a suspended bridge. You see a nice gradation on either side. You can embed those anchors right into the hillside. You're not having to lift up the structures terribly much. But during the floodplain, if you're able to access a bridge structure in a floodplain, you almost always want a suspension bridge where you're lifting that deck up and over. Because if we were to, in this exact same site, put a suspended bridge, which essentially it's just your anchors with cables hanging, you're going to have to lift those anchors up quite, quite a bit in order to allow it just to hang and to avoid the water. Ooh, that was fancy. Um, but do you just put it on any hill slope? Going back to how is your bridge going to fail? It's by walking up to this site and saying, hey, that looks like a great idea. I think right in the middle of a big pit of erosion, I would like to build my, build my bridge. And I've seen bridges built in places like these. Well, that's a bad picture. Sorry, guys. Another one, if you could see this a little bit more clearly, it's literally that it's been washed out. So from upstream, it's kind of a, a filled in uh, scar from a small landslide. And when you get to rocks, this is uh, for those of you that are doing geotech, and you take the rock mechanics class, there's a lot of fracture plane issues that you really wanted to, to discover and be considerate of when you're looking at a hill slope. So the first one is in embedding or fracture plane. Is it just going to slip out? Another one is more of a wedge failure. So you see this when you have fracture planes in one direction bisecting another direction. Depending how that ends up lying on that surface, there can literally be chunks just ready to slide. Avoid having anything where completely vertical stacks. You guys can see this driving up I-70 quite a bit, even if it's granitic rock and you have pretty solid stuff, there are areas where you're having vertical bed planes. And it's similar to soil, like I mentioned, you can also have complete landslides and back scarring from rock. So being considerate of, am I gonna go build something that in the scope of how big this scar is, our bridge is that little rock right there. It's inconsequential loading-wise oftentimes, but if something's going, it's going to move. Here's one example. 
Failure report. Lane 5 destroys bridge. Need to be on that. Um, soil stability. So in general, soil, soil doesn't have nearly the same kind of uh, cohesive property relative to the, the rock face as a rock, obviously. So when I go out to survey, survey a site, the first thing I look for is do I have a smooth profile? Anytime I've got a lot of jetting in and out, a lot of times it's indicating that the water has moved. It's coming in, it's undercutting a soil bank, even if it's not there today, or even if the community says, oh, no, it's fine, it hasn't been there before. Especially the strongly cut out, that's showing an environment where you have very high velocity water coming right in and scooping it out. <coughs> Likely to create a failure. Same picture that I should have had up with, so with rock. If you have vertical, you can have a vertical face of soil. It's going to topple right in, as a, in addition to having the potential for a, a slide failure. Erosion and avoid landslides. So here's another failure report. Any other indicators about this particular picture that would make you concerned with building a bridge anywhere near the slope side? No vegetation near. Very good. No, no vegetation. What else? <coughs> how, how fast does that water have to be moving to have rocks that big? That's ripping. It's a really, really fast moving river. So when you go out to survey, you have to think back in the napkin, how am I going to do a preliminary survey? What's the first thing I'm going to do? Pick kind of where I want it to be, where's my center line. And between Mickey and I, where am I going to put my tiers? Do I put them right on the edge to make it shorter? Do I put them back 50 meters to make it easy, make sure I'll never have a problem? Or do you find some sort of compromise? We have a standard, you know, draw a line from your bank back up relative to your rock or soil, position it accordingly further back. But it's really an engineering judgment that you guys are making for yourselves. If you see a river with rocks that are bigger than you possibly could move, I'm more and more and more conservative. Because even if today that river is dry, there's some water coming through there that you can't probably predict. This is another one that, um, at this point, I wanted to pull up Google Earth and Envision right now, I have Google Earth on the screen. Lots of awesome. Zooming in and out. But there's a trail, and the trail happens to be right coming through this guy. So people are walking, da 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 da, and they want to walk right there and then go on their way. So the first place the community takes you is where their trail is. They're like, yeah, that's exactly where I want the bridge. That's exactly how I want it to be. And oftentimes, you show up, and that sounds actually like a fairly good idea. Oh, yeah, looks good. But maybe you can't see the full picture. <clears throat> oftentimes, you're in a very densely forested area. Maybe the scale of this picture is a little bit further down. So you're talking 100 to 200 meters down is where the river converges. But getting a GPS unit to get to your point, taking a number of different cross-section profiles, and going home and then checking, where was I? What can I not see from the ground level? Now, I was, I was telling Matt a story this morning that a Virginia Tech team had visited a site, surveyed the site, started designing the site. And I think it was probably 80 or 90 percent of the way done with their design before we realized that was where the cars also went. So do you want to put a piece of pedestrian infrastructure blocking the way that during the dry season a vehicle accesses? There's a bunch of considerations when you guys are there, and oftentimes the existing trail is not where you want to be. So, yeah, this preliminary design piece is what you guys ultimately are responsible for. This is your 47 sites that you're visiting, and you're theoretically going to have the back of the napkin calculations for 27 of them in order to build three. If you're going to build a suspension bridge, 
you need to know where is the high water level. We'll come back to that on the day we're talking about the hydrology. But that's the said blue line. And where is the final deck going to lie at its lowest point? And the difference between those two is called freeboard. Freeboard is the differential between the lowest point in your bridge and the highest point in your water. We recommend two meter for floodplains and four meters for gorge. And who wants to explain why? Why would I want more clearance on a gorge than a floodplain? Um, I guess when on high waters, a lot of debris is going to be flowing downstream, and you don't want that to get caught up on your deck and, I guess, take down the whole bridge. That's true for both floodplain and gorges. Why would I want to have a gorge? Mike? I'd say for the gorges, it's more, a little more flexible uh, vertically than, than your suspended bridge, so it, it could possibly have more to, more to sink down. Something like that, like the flexibility of, the, of each type. You're on the right track. You're definitely right. Mickey? Um, since in a floodplain, the, the width is a lot wider, so the same volume of water won't make it rise as high as in a gorge. Exactly. So we have, uh, we essentially have a backup plan. As the water starts rushing, it, in a floodplain, it goes out. But if you're, in a, if you're in a mountainous gorge and there's walls on either side, that water goes up. You want to give yourself a little bit more of a cushion. Same vernacular, same freeboard being the difference between your high water level and the lowest point in your cable on a suspended bridge. We have the same number value between the two. But I think what the big misconception is, is, oh, well, I will always build a suspension bridge because it's easier. I can lift my deck up and over the water. I don't have to worry about that sag. There's two big reasons we don't want to do that. One, it's much more expensive. A suspension bridge is about twice as expensive, up to four times as expensive. And that's just with our design. If you go to Helvetas or if you go and pull a design out of something you would build here in the States, it's an entire order of magnitude more expensive. And the second part, it's more complex. So if you think about a suspended bridge, you could just see it in the drawings, right? Like here's these like masonry towers, sag, go. Suspension, you've got footings, you've got towers, you have transition blocks. You have to figure out how you're gonna get cable up and over a 10 meter tall tower. So trying to figure out how to work with a suspended bridge type is often in your best interest. It also allows you to go greater spans without having to worry about lateral stability. So ugly. This guy's 140 meters right before we were putting on wind guys. And here's an 80 meter, 90 meter suspension where suspension projects you need lateral support much quick, more quickly. And a wind guy is literally if I am have a bridge between me and Sean and the bridge cables are coming this way, wind guys come in this guy in a parabolic curve to the side with suspenders clipping in that allow it, or that reduce its ability to move from side to side. Another failure report. This was from a high water event and it's hard to see on the slide but this is where in my opinion they built these towers far too near the water level. You can see right now those huge rocks that water is not flowing. This is the lowest that water probably gets, and that's maybe two meters from where that lowest cable is to high water. In a flood event, that water is up to the deck, at least. And like you mentioned, it's not the water is going to take the bridge out. It's everything that the water is carrying, the trees, the limbs. As soon as one tree catches, everything else catches, and you've created a dam. You said the, the information you get about the water level is mainly from the community members telling you, like, historic levels? Yeah. Or is it other... Um, so we do both. So there's physical evidence. Of you're able to go in and within a bit of certainty, figure out the last 10 years where have you hit. You ask all the community members. 
A lot of times we'll take cross sections up and down river of a profile, input that into a HECRAS hydraulic modeler, do catchment area models. But ultimately, are you going to do all this analysis and rely only on that data point? Or are you going to be a little bit more realistic and say, well, we had a Rice University team that had a, a val I think a value of high water that was something like five meters higher than their physical evidence, four, four or five. You think about that, that's wrong. That's just wrong. So you have to really be able to work with what data inputs you have and what you don't. And this particular bridge just totally was ripped out. I believe this is a locally designed one where they're just trying to have crossing and didn't really consider the freeboard issue. So other considerations. Here's our bridge. And where I'm at is the nearest point that I can drive to. How do you get materials to there? There's an old trail. And there's a new trail where we want to build the bridge. What other considerations do you have when this river has been moving? Sorry, this somehow layer got moved, as you can see. But see the blue should be up that way. Considering how, if a new trail, old trail, if you're building that trail in order to get it to your new crossing, what additional work do you have? Not always easy. One of the ways that I like to do this is when I first go to a community is I do a community map. Where's the hospital? Where's the clinic? Where are the communities? How far is it to each community? Because oftentimes some of the most obvious solutions are right in front of you. Where do you store materials is a big deal. Where do you have a trusted person that you can leave thousands of dollars worth of your tools and your materials? And where are folks coming? It's not just the community right at the bridge. A lot of times it's the communities that are further away that are benefiting the most. So you've selected, you decided the technical and social feasibility are both online. So you decide you're going to start with your community and go, go, local government agreements. Land ownership's a big issue. Can't stress this enough. If you're going to work in the developing world, everything is contractual. Makes a big deal, and I'm making drastic generalizations. But if I walked up to Mickey and said, I want to build a bridge in your backyard, again, there's so much permitting that goes into that and so much, like, right-of-way signage, there's tons of considerations. So the least that we can do is to remember this is someone's property. They probably are making money on that land. There might be agriculture that's being ripped up. You're not just going to be able to walk in and build a bridge wherever you want it. And to make sure that that is understood, what the agreement is before you break ground, is critical. We do tripartite agreements, which just means that you're working with the community, you're working with the government, and you're working with a third-party entity. That's us. Contractually, what are we doing? What are we here to do? Who is it responsible? Who is going to be maintaining the structure? Who is going to be constructing it? Should all be really lined up before you start. The same way you would do here in the States. You wouldn't just start a project without a contract with the owner about what is expected. I'm out of time. So, once you kind of decide this is your bridge, uh, you need to be able to do a proper survey. For B. You want to keep annotations? No. Good. I'm going to give the microphone. All right, so brief introduction. Um, my name is Matthew Curtis, like Avery said. Um, I've worked my entire career as, uh, for a contractor. I've done a uh, wide range of projects, uh, highway projects, 
bridge projects, uh, some mine infrastructure, railroads, worked on uh, private owners, public owners, different uh, contracting types, uh, traditional bid build projects, design build projects, public private partnerships, kind of a whole host of different things. Um, and the approach here is kind of a broad overview of surveying. How many people have taken surveying of some form or another? Nice. So this is kind of a refresher, I think, it, it, uh, at best. It uh, kind of talks about uh, really what I, what I hope to kind of convey is that uh, it's a whole field you can get a four-year degree in. And I'm just going to touch on some high points. And what I'm going to try to, I guess, establish is that there's kind of theoretical things and then there's kind of more practical stuff like Avery does. Like what, what can you hope to get when you go to the field, when you're kind of bushwhacking your way through trying to find a site? How do you take like the theoretical stuff that you learn in class and how do you apply that to a site? So we'll talk through different types of surveying. We'll talk through uh, different equipment surveying methods, um, surveying accuracy, which I think is a big, big thing. Um, I think that kind of gets glossed over a bit, um, especially when, when you're out on a remote site. How do you confirm and how do you feel comfortable with the data that you get? You know, it's like Avery said, if you're there, you've got a limited amount of time, you've got uh, 40 different sites to look at, you're kind of hurrying through, you get there late in the day. How do you, how do you leave the site confident with what you end up with? Um, then we'll talk through field procedures, kind of basic uh, differential leveling, and then uh, I'll kind of highlight some project examples. Um, and we'll finally head to the field. Um, so what is surveying? Surveying, um, it's conveying boundary lines, uh, conveying earth surface onto, uh, onto paper and conveying it to somebody else. It's how do you convey what you're seeing in the field to somebody else so they can use that information. Um, and it's using math and science. It's using uh, angles, distances, elevations. Um, and there's, there's two basic types. Um, geodetic surveying is, is probably the larger field, um, and that's more to do with large extended areas. It's very precise stuff. Um, it's mapping, that type of thing. Uh, there's, the other is plane surveying, which is most kind of construction building sites, that type of stuff. It's uh, just using a datum and everything is X, Y, and Z. If you don't take into account the curvature of the earth, you don't take into kind of the more complex uh, portions of, of surveying. So let's see, the, the first is control surveying. And really what, what we use that for on construction sites is to kind of establish boundaries and establish kind of a network that we can rely on. Um, so one of the things we'll talk about is benchmarks. And like when you get to a site, a remote site, you're going to pick a, a benchmark. And for a small network, that can be something that's just immovable. For larger construction projects, it's got to be something you'll, you'll get a data point that someone gives you. Well, that may not be relative to the rest of your network. So just because it's a given, you can't necessarily trust it. It has to relate to everything else that you're building. Um, the next is boundary survey, and that's usually used in uh, kind of land development, uh, that type of stuff. It's you're establishing boundaries for property lines or easements, things like that. Topographic surveys, um, it's really just terrain mapping. You're trying to get kind of a feel of the lay of the land. Um, hydrographic surveys, it's basically the same thing, only underwater, essentially. Um, so the primary focus, I think, for what you do in my field and in, in the field of kind of site layout is construction survey. You're laying out things that you're going to build. You're trying to locate those relative to other objects around you. Um, also, route surveying is, is kind of relevant if uh, you're doing a water transmission line or something like that in the developing world, you're trying to establish kind of a path that you use to get there. You could also use this if you were uh, trying to get an uh, access road or a trail. You might want to kind of figure out the constraints of getting materials in. You could use kind of some route surveying stuff. Photogrammetry, um, I've used this a bit on other projects. Uh, it's basically aerial surveying. They fly over, um, we've used it for earthwork quantities, things like that. It's kind of less accurate, less precise, but you can gather lots of data very, very rapidly. So we'll move into equipment. Um, there's really three different components to, to any survey, and you need to get 
elevations, you need to get distances, and in some cases, you need to get angles. Um, if you're doing kind of simpler forms, like with abney levels, you don't necessarily need angles. You're just kind of looking straight lines, and you're kind of, like, like Avery said, if you're doing uh, cross sections through a bridge site, you do three of them. You're not really relating points adjacent to each other other than just they're 30 meters apart or whatever. So we'll talk through um, kind of an order of uh, magnitude of um, accuracy and price. You've got like uh, the Abney level um, and kind of the simpler version, uh, a typical hand level. It doesn't have the clinometer on it. So it basically just establishes a line of sight and a level line. Um, you're kind of limited on distance that you can see and the accuracy that you're going to get from them. The price is, is reasonable. It's uh, a couple hundred bucks. Probably the most common uh, piece of equipment that you'd see on a construction site are uh, builder's levels or dumpy levels. They go by several different names. And what we use today are automatic levels. Um, they've got a series of uh, prisms that are inside that compensate for kind of little movements in the instrument. Um, I think like every construction site I've ever been on, there's uh, guys that have got them kicking around in the back of their um, toolboxes, things like that. It's just the basic construction layout tool. So next are theodolites and total stations. And these are probably the most common uh, like professional surveying equipment. Um, the difference being theodolites are essentially a dumb version of a total station. Um, the, the older models were called transits, and they allow you to turn uh, vertical and horizontal angles. Um, but what they're missing is there's no distance measuring capabilities with them. They just will provide you kind of accuracy of angles in a couple different directions. With a total station, um, it's also built in with an electronic uh, distance measuring tool, and it uses a, typically a prism, or now there's reflectorless technology where you can literally shoot a laser off an object and bounce back, and it'll tell you the distance to it, angle to it, all that stuff. Um, the downside of these is they become rather expensive, and you have to be kind of more training. It's not, the, not like a typical uh, pick-it-up-and-go kind of thing. Also, the... Uh, the data output, it, it reduces the need for field notes. I mean, you still keep field notes on your setups and that type of stuff, but the information's all digital and electronic, and you can transfer it directly into a CAD program, and it saves kind of all of the handwork. So what you're paying for on the front end and, and kind of training for personnel and, and on equipment, you're making up for on the back end. Um, the theodolites today, I mean, they're, I think for the money, you, it's just as good to go with a total station. You kind of... You, you lose a lot of accuracy trying to do taping and chaining, that kind of stuff, and it's uh, not really practical these days. So finally, your uh, GPS. Um, these are more and more common, and uh, what we found, they're, they rely generally on a control network like we talked about, and we typically will set these up on projects and we'll establish a network around them of control so we know exactly where the points are. The nice thing about GPS is it relies on the base stations that are established at control points, plus also um, different satellites that are um, kind of locating where the points are. So if you were on a site just laying out with a, a transit or a theodolite or a total station, any deviation or any mistakes that you make when you're turning angles gets compounded, and there's really no way to kind of tie that back in anything else. With GPS, it allows you to tie into the local system that you have, the local control network, but the other kind of global control network. And it makes it probably more accurate than you can really get when you take out the human error and things like that. Um, but again, it's, you're paying a lot more up front. Um, so there's, there's some limitations to that. So on to distance measurement. Um, the old standby are uh, our tapes. Um, they, they have their limitations. The biggest thing is it's, it's, it's not as cut and dry as you think. It's not just go out there and you know, pull the tape, get it close enough. Um, there's a bit of finesse. You have, to, uh, you have to pull the tape at a certain tension. You have to make corrections for temperature, that sort of thing. Um, the electric, electronic distance measuring tools, um, they're nice, but they're also, they have their limitations. You know, you can't, uh, like this one I think will go to um, maybe seven, 800 feet, something like that, but your accuracy diminishes. So there's a trade-off there. It's, it's quick and it's easy, but you're going to kind of pay for it in the end. So next are, with the equipment are uh, survey rods, and there's a whole host of different kinds. Um, some of them here are um, a metric, metric version. There's uh, decimal feet, feet and inches, 
There's also um, Stadia rods. There's digital level rods that are kind of look like a barcode. So again, these are relatively inexpensive and somewhat disposable, I think, in the, the construction world. Um, you can use other things, uh, like with Avery's Abney level setup, you can just use sticks of equal height and, uh, and still achieve the same thing. Um, so the equipment, uh, the prism and rod is used typically with uh, like the higher end equipment with uh, total stations, the satellites, that type of stuff. And it's got a prism in it that bounces light beams off. Um, again, I said earlier, there's uh, reflectorless technology now where you don't need that. You can essentially shoot objects, and you know the the downfall of that is you don't really know exactly what you're hitting. I mean, you can see it, but you don't know if it's exactly where you think it is. Whereas if you've got a guy standing there holding a rod, you're pretty certain that he's where he needs to be. So we'll talk a little bit about surveying methods. Um, I think the first and probably most uh, common is uh, differential leveling. And this relates um, the differences in elevations um, between different points on a site. It doesn't, uh, doesn't give you much more than that, just elevation differences. The next is uh, stadia leveling. And stadia leveling was, um, it's still used today, and it was kind of an original attempt at refining precision and accuracy. And it uses three readings, uh, simultaneous readings, when you're looking through the, uh, when you're looking through the instrument. And the three readings, reduce some error. So you're making three independent measurements and they're all related to each other and you can kind of immediately identify if there's a blunder in the field. Um, the other thing that it also allows you to do is uh, estimate distances that you're shooting. And uh, that can be useful on a bridge site. You can, you know, if you've, uh, if you've done your preliminary survey, you go out there, you think you're going to build it and you want to start to check things. You set up on one side, you know, you don't want to cross the stream. You can sight across, and if you've got somebody set up on the other side, you can take a reading and kind of get a guesstimate on what the original measurements were. And it's probably as accurate as trying to pull a 100-meter tape across the gorge. So it's kind of another way to check the information that you've been given. Uh, so the next is uh, trigonometric leveling, and that's primarily what the ABNY level uses. It doesn't use horizontal planes and elevations. It uses a slope distance and an angle to calculate the differences in elevations. Next are uh, traverses and level loops. Um, I think they have kind of limited applicability to, uh, to this type of rural infrastructure. And it generally, uh, I think the key points are that it, it ties into known points and you can kind of reduce, uh, you can tie all of your error together. When you, get to, when you get done, you kind of end up at a known point. You know how far off you are. You know the known elevation, and you can kind of make corrections. You're not really going to have that on a site. You're going to maybe check from one benchmark to maybe another benchmark on the other side, but they're, they're kind of a guesstimate. Um, next, we have reciprocal leveling. Um, uh, reciprocal leveling kind of has two different principles. Um, First is there's error that accumulates as you're surveying, and it's based on the distance that you're, that you're shooting. So the idea is that if you can keep equal distances for your foresight and your backsight, then those errors kind of cancel each other. And with stadia leveling, it's helpful because you've also kind of got a gauge of distance from one shot to another. When you're taking your measurements, you know how far away your rod is without necessarily having to pull a tape. So it allows you to kind of see, all right, well, this one's... 20 meters, this one's 25 meters, and then when you come back to compensate for errors, you kind of got a record of what the differences are. The other way you can use reciprocal leveling, which we'll talk about a little bit later, is uh, you can rely on that error by shooting a short site and a far site across the river, and then relating those two together to be able to establish the differences in the elevation. Um, the final one, and I think which is probably most important, is profile leveling. And you're just trying to establish the profile along a center line of a bridge. Um, so kind of to recap, I think differential leveling and the profile leveling are the two, two big ones that you'd use in kind of rural infrastructure development. So this is just kind of a graphic showing a typical uh, differential leveling setup. And as you see, the instruments, they would move from left to right. So you'd move from benchmark A on the left to benchmark K. 
And again, if you have known points on each side, then you can tie those together and any errors that accumulate, you can, you can compensate for when you're, when you're finished. So this is an example of stadia leveling. And you can see there's uh, the crosshairs. There's, there's three sets of crosshairs there. Um, you can make readings on the top line, the middle line, and the bottom line and record each, each of those values. And you can also typically the, uh, the distance between the top line and the bottom line is a factor of 100. So if you're reading in a metric scale or a feet and inches scale, whatever the scale is, it's mul the distance is multiplied by 100. Um, this is an example of uh, trigonometric leveling. So this is what you would use in kind of a preliminary apnea level survey. And uh, you'd measure that slope distance. It's, it's generally pretty difficult on a steep slope to hold plumb bobs and pull a level tape and, uh, and get an accurate horizontal distance. It's much easier to kind of sight along an angle that you can measure and record that distance. And you can use those two to equate the horizontal distance and the vertical change in elevation. So this is some examples of traverse and level loops. Um, again, you can see the, the triangles are, are kind of known points. And as you travel along, uh, you tie back into points that you know. Here's kind of the, the example of reciprocal leveling as it would apply to, to a bridge site. You can site from, uh, from one side of the river, shoot a site that's close to you, maybe from one uh, wind guy to another wind guy, and then a shot across the river and then move across to a similar type thing, and you can get kind of relative dif differences in elevation between the two. So the next thing we'll talk about is um, angle measurement. There's two basic differences. One, the one is bearing measurements and azimuth uh, measurements. Bearings utilize a kind of an alphanumeric designation relative to cardinal directions, and the angles are measured from those cardinal directions. And the second is uh, azimuths. And these, I think, are probably more applicable. If you were out on a site and you were trying to gauge where you are, you can take a pocket compass with you. You can get kind of a relatively um, rel relative measurement to, to north to kind of orient yourself to the site. Um, like Avery said, I think you get out there and can kind of, you know, you think you're in one spot, and then you go back and look at Google Earth, and it's, it's a nice kind of reference point to know kind of where you are. The other angle measurements are the vertical angles. Um, so what we've talked about before, horizontal angles. Um, these two are complementary. So a vertical angle is measured from horizontal up, and a zenith angle is measured from kind of the zenith down. And the two should, should complement each other. So this, this graphic kind of gives you an example of those. So I'll talk a bit about um, surveying accuracy. Like it says, I think the, the one thing to keep in mind is that all these measurements are imperfect. And um, I can kind of show you some examples when we get done. Um, the, the errors can accumulate from you know people making mistakes, instrument calibrations. Um, you guys think of any uh, kind of natural and environmental considerations that would cause errors? Certainly, yeah, if you're taping, it wouldn't be a big one. Anything else? So I'll give you an example that, that we had to deal with. So I built a, um, a cable stay bridge in Louisiana. And uh, the towers, as we were building up, we had an accuracy that we had to achieve and tolerances that the towers had to be within a certain degree of plumb. And what you have to do with structures like that, whether it's a building, anything, um, as we would survey them, we had to survey them at a given times of the day. So we'd survey at 4 o'clock in the morning before the sun came up. And this job was in southern Louisiana, so it got really hot during the day. And the towers, as they grew, would eventually move through the course of the day. And I think that that's something, certainly, when, when I was in school, I never really thought much about. And it would move in kind of order of magnitude, like fractions of a feet, six inches this way, six inches that way. So it's things like that that you, I don't necessarily think you are kind of intuitive. You think that it's, okay, so you've got this degree of kind of accuracy that you can get in this instrument. You rely on the instrument, but 
checking like the time of day that you do these things. Is it first thing in the morning? Is it, uh, you know, what's the weather like? Is it sunny? Is it cloudy? They all kind of add up to these different errors and they're, they're easy to overlook. So that brings me to accuracy and precision. I think any of you that have taken surveying classes have seen these slides. It's, um, accuracy is really, uh, is the number correct? Is it, does it represent the true value? And precision is how repeatable it is. Um, is the, uh, do the, if you were to make the measurement five times, would you get the same reading? So along with um, the, the tolerances that I talked about, um, there, the National Geodetic Survey has specifications for vertical control. Um, and they go from third order on the low end to first order class one surveying. Um, and really the, the point I want to try to make here is it's, it's easy to kind of rely on the kind of the literature and the sales pitch that you get from equipment manufacturers and think that you can get this high level of precision. But practically speaking, like that stuff is very expensive. To try to get a first order class one survey for like a construction project, it's just not, it's not practical. And it's very rarely done. So you kind of have to determine for yourself, and I think Brian talked about this a little bit last week, is what is an impact? You know, what are the errors? What are the differences? Like, how does it affect the design? How does it affect the structure? And what is acceptable? What, what, what tolerances can you live with? So here are the kind of the differences. Um, the maximum sites you can take, they're, they're nearly double. Um, and that's just within kind of this class. In most construction surveying, it's not even third order. Um, and I think the, the telling part of this is if you, if you ran a loop for one kilometer, you can be off by four millimeters, which is next to nothing. It's, it's nearly impossible to get that level of accuracy. And what that usually requires is you're doing kind of a loop one way and a loop back another way, and you're double checking and you're tying things in. Um, it's just not practical for, for most applications in construction. Matt, sorry, I just don't understand. So is there for first order, is that like within the realm of total stations? There's like a first order total station and a third order total? Yeah, it's, it's really, it's not just the equipment, but it's also the, the system that you're using. So, you know, if to, for a third order, you may be able to just to go through one time, uh, say a building site or something. You may be able to run through, check the numbers, and get to that level of accuracy. Okay. It's usually like uh, the first order stuff you have to do multiple times. And you have to, like here, the, the differences in the backsite distances between the two, you, they have to be nearly equal within two meters. So it takes a lot more pre-planning. Like the system that you're using to acquire your data is, is much tighter. You know, with, within 10 meters, you can usually just gauge that in the field. You'd go out there, and yeah, we seem like we're within 30 feet. But for, uh, for the other, it's, it's a lot more front-end planning. So kind of practical field limitations um, for rough staking if we were uh, you know building a, a highway you know we're kind of just roughing in a road that type of thing we wouldn't spend any time or more money to get anything more refined than say a foot um, horizontally if it's within a foot it's good enough and um, as we get to kind of finish grade um, practically speaking like unless we've got professional surveyors out there giving us uh, kind of fine fine-tuned Elevations were within, you know, a couple of inches horizontally and, and, you know, maybe a half an inch vertically. And it's, it's usually good enough for what most infrastructure is built, you know, buildings, anything. It's, it's not really to a high level of, of accuracy. So we'll talk a little bit about field procedures. Um, and we'll, I guess to start that, we need to talk a little bit about the definitions. So benchmarks are, are a, kind of a known fixed point. And like I said earlier, I think the thing to keep in mind, um, a lot of times uh, on infrastructure projects, we'll get known points from government agencies, and we'll check them and tie them with our own instruments and our own equipment from, say, one end of a project to another. If you've got a 10-mile-long 10, 10 highway project you're doing, you kind of tie those together, and you'll notice there's errors between them. And you have to account for that. You have to kind of compensate either to correct what you think the known value is, or you have to adjust your network to kind of match that. Um, back sites are, are generally taking f to a known elevation. And four sites kind of complement them. They're, they're kind of establishing a new elevation that, that uh, you're assuming to be correct. Um, and linking those two are the HI, or the height of the instrument. And uh, any intermediate 
points that you establish are typically called turning points, um, and that allows you to kind of progress the instrument along the route that you're using. I guess the last thing, uh, the convention on most projects, you know, bridge and road projects, are to use stationing. So it, a station, as it's, as it's shown there, 1 plus 0, 0 is equal to uh, either 100 feet or 100 meters, depending on which you're working with. So the next is kind of the, the data collection portion of it. Um, so now you've got your terminology, you're getting ready to kind of go out and perform the task. Um, and it's wh what do you include, what information do you need? Um, and I think the accuracy is probably the most important part. What, uh, what you're putting down and how reliable it is, taking the time to, to make sure that you trust the readings. The second is the integrity of it. Um, so the typical convention for surveyors is you, you, you never erase anything. If you make a mistake, you cross it out, you leave it there, because it's a telltale if there is a mistake. You can always go back and kind of remember what you did, or if you transpose two numbers, if you erase it, it's gone. There's no hope of go getting it back. Um, I think kind of with any good engineering uh, calculations and whatnot, um, they need to be neat and legible. They need to kind of follow a logical arrangement so somebody can follow what you're doing. Um, and sketches are, are invaluable. I mean, it's one thing to have a bunch of numbers on a page, but similar to erasing things, if you have a sketch and even if there's a blunder somewhere, you can kind of make sense of it with a sketch. Um, and the other, the last thing is kind of general notes, um, where the site is, uh, the time of day that you're there, what the weather's like. If, uh, if you get to a site and it's, it's uh, 110 degrees out and you're completely no shade, it's going to affect the measurements that you get. You know, uh, if you're someplace else and it's, it's sleeting and raining and near freezing, it's going to affect the results you get. So it's, it's things like that. You can, uh, somebody else who's looking at them can kind of gather information from them. So here are just a few examples of kind of field book layouts. Um, generally, you've got a sketch on one page and uh, just information. This is for distance measurements. This is a differential leveling setup. Um, lots of information on uh, benchmarks that they've used, um, elevations uh, that they've established. And, and you'll notice on all of these, there's, a, there's error checks, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, this is for uh, uh, like a traverse around a, maybe a building site. This, um, it's basically tie angles and distances, um, no real elevations considered. And these you can, you can typically close geometrically. You can, you can calculate the different angles and the distances and find out, okay, so if you start at point A and you end up back at point A, if you sum up all of those angles and all those distances, you'll find out that the two points don't coincide. And that ends up what we call misclosure. And then you can adjust, your, adjust each of those measurements based on what the total amount of error that you've accumulated. And it's typically based on the length that you've measured or the angles, um, so you can correct each one of those based on the values that you've gathered. So this is, I think, where the rubber meets the road for the stuff we're going to do this afternoon. It's uh, how to read a survey rod. Uh, most rods are laid out in a pretty similar fashion. See on the left you've got a metric rod, and on the right you've got uh, an English imperial feet, intensive feet. Um, typically the, uh, the large numbers are the, the whole feet. The next number size down are tenths of a feet. And then each one of the dashes, um, whether it's the top or the bottom of the dash, is a hundredth. Um, if you want to be more precise than that, um, you can generally estimate between the two values. So if you pick a spot on a black line, if it's not at the top or directly at the bottom, you estimate, is it 10% up, 30% up, and assign that value to the, to the hundredths value. Uh, you said like on, on tapes there's adjustments for the temperature. Do you adjust the rods too? Like the heat of the day or whatever? Um, not generally. I mean, the rods, uh, they're, the, the length is so short, and uh, like the rod that's shown there is a fiberglass rod, and really the, the coefficient of expansion is, is nothing. Um, and with, uh, even with steel or aluminum rods, um, they're so short that you can't read it that accurately from any distance. So, so uh, Distance measurement is, I think, is kind of an often overlooked uh, or kind of taken for granted, you think. You know, you've laid out a deck in the back lawn or you've done a little bit of measurement. It's, it's not that difficult, but there's quite a bit more to that. Um, 
if you're doing kind of real accurate surveying with a tape, um, it should be a horizontal tape, and you should use plumb bobs as center from point to point. Um, that's not real practical for sites that, that you're going to be building for bridges. Um, you're going to be measuring probably along a slope. Um, so it's good even within that to, if you're sighting down with an uh, ABNY level and you're saying you're shooting at 20, 20 degrees, then you probably want to have the, the distance measure as parallel to that as possible. The more, the more difference that you have between those, the more errors you're going to accumulate. And, and again, it depends on what the end goal is. If it's kind of just a preliminary um, site survey and you're just trying to gather data, that's probably not that necessary to take the time to, to be very accurate. But if it's the final site and you're getting ready to lay out where the foundations are going to go, that may have a big impact if you, you know, don't take the extra time. So the, uh, as I said, the steel tapes are, are uh, very temperature dependent, but uh, the good part is steel is very predictable, so you can make temperature corrections very easily. So the instrument setup, um, this is probably the second thing to second most important thing. Um, so this setup, as you see, um, you'd start with a level on a four screw instrument over two screws. Um, there's a couple of things to remember as well. You, you want to always move two of the screws at the same time. You never want to move one at a time. And you want to make sure when you start that all four screws are tight. Um, sometimes you can adjust one and it becomes kind of a little wobbly. You want everything to start off nice and tight. You adjust two of them. Um, if you remember nothing else, then it's the, the, the left thumb rule. So the, the bubble will always follow your left thumb. So if you want it to go left, you move your thumb left, thumb left. If you want it to go right, you move your left thumb right. And you move the two kind of opposite of each other. So you get uh, the first position leveled. You'll rotate the, um, the eyepiece and do the same thing again. And then you can rotate it back to double check it, but that should get you level. Um, on a three-screw instrument, you put it uh, parallel the two of the screws, adjust those, get it level, and rotate it over the third one and adjust that so that it's uh, set, uh, centered. You'll have a little bullseye level. Um, we'll look through those when we get out in the field. So the, the process for differential leveling, kind of in very simple terms, um, I'll kind of breeze through these because I think it's, it's a little dry. I've got a graphic, I think, that illustrates it better. Um, but you want to identify a benchmark. Um, on, a, on a bridge site, you want to pick something that's, that's not going to be there. Don't pick a, a rock that's in a stream that you may come back two months later and it's been washed away. Um, and you want to be able to identify where that is. Um, prepare the, the field book so you can record the data that you're going to use. Um, if you, you, know, you know what you're going to name the points, um, and I think uh, the Bridges Prosperity's manual kind of lay most of that stuff out there for you, so it's, it's kind of easy. Um, the next part is setting up the tripod, leveling the instrument, and then you start taking readings. So you measure back to your benchmark, um, take a reading. It gives you the height of the instrument that you're working with. And then you measure down from there to start calculating what, what the elevation points are. So kind of in a graphic layout here, you start with your first point and you measure up. So typically the um, back sights are positive. So you'd add 8.42 to the, the starting elevation of 820 and you'd get the height of your instrument. So once you've got that established, you can move the rod to the next location and take your second reading. So you'd measure down the 1.2 and you'd end up with the new benchmark turning point elevation. So then from there, you've transferred the elevation. You can take the instrument, move the instrument along. You start back at the elevation that you just established. You measure up the 11.56 feet in this case, and you establish the new height of the instrument. And from there, you're free to move the rod so now you've got a known elevation at your, at your instrument height. You measure down to establish the new elevation. You just carry on this procedure as you progress, and in this case, from kind of left to right across the screen. So the next type of leveling, uh, like I said, is, is profile leveling. 
and really what you're trying to do here is establish what the terrain is like and uh, I think the Bridge to Prosperity Manual details that with the Abney level. You want to understand where the high water level is, where the stream banks are, um, if there's uh, things that it can be, the sag of a cable, things like that, you want to kind of document. Um, this is, uh, I've included this just to kind of give a little more information on stadia leveling. Um, if you look uh, at the, the top left side uh, under benchmark A, you take three measurements. Um, so in this case, the top, top uh, line would read 0.718 and the bottom would read 0 0.550. You take the difference between those two and multiply it by 100, you'll get the 16.8 that's shown there. And that'll kind of give you a gauge on the distance. Um, here they're not making uh, measurements with tapes, but it's a, it's a good way to, you know, if you're in the field, to kind of get a rough measurement across someplace. It saves you some time, I think. Uh, and it's also a kind of a double check. So reciprocal leveling, um, you can use this to, to kind of get relative differences in elevations. I think this, this, this can be kind of a challenging uh, problem when you're in the field. You've got a benchmark set up on one side, and that's fine to use that, but the chances that you're going to go all the way across 60 or 100 meters across to be able to tie back into those, um, how can you correlate the two? Um, if you were to use an Abney level, work from one side of the site, work down, get down to the stream bank, and kind of establish a point there, you can measure across to transfer that information and then do the same thing on the opposite side, and you can correlate the two, the two sides. It's not the most accurate way, but it kind of gives you uh, kind of an order of magnitude, or are you off by a foot, are you off by a couple of inches. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's also more accurate than trying to measure, you know, 300 meters from one side of a gorge across to another side of a gorge. You're, just, you're not going to be able to be that accurate. So it's, it's kind of another kind of, I think, real-world application of how to apply. Um, and you're really kind of compensating for the errors that you're going to get in the instrument. You're kind of using it to your advantage. So next we'll talk a little bit about traverses. Um, I mean, these, I think they have kind of a limited applicability, but if you were doing uh, like a water infrastructure project or a building, uh, something like that, there, you can use them to tie into known points. If uh, taking water from a school to, to a water source, something like that, and you have relative known um, points, then you can use them. Uh, I think that the, the biggest thing is you, you can tie them together based on uh, angles and, uh, and elevations geometrically. You just use uh, geometry and trig to kind of correlate those points and, and kind of gives you a degree of certainty on, on the information that you come back with. So I think the, the final thing to talk about is error correction. Um, You can, you can get carried away. There's whole schools of thought on how to account for errors as they accumulate. I think uh, probably the simplest way is if you're tying from one point to another, you can add up all of the back sites and all of the four sites, and the two, sh when you compare them from the starting benchmark to the ending benchmark, the two should be close. And that's like the simple way you can check in the field. And I think that's probably a good, site, uh, a good kind of practice if you were out in the field and you were tying things together uh, across the bridge site, you'd hate to leave and you know, spend two hours traveling to another site and then get back and look at your notes and realize that there's a bus there when it would take a few minutes to just go and reshoot and recorrect problems there. Um, typically in, in, uh, kind of in professional practice, uh, you know, misclosure, it, it always happens um, and there's allowable tolerances and how much misclosure you're allowed to have. Um, if you don't hit those tolerances, then you typically have to redo things. Uh, most of the time, it's you just apply a correction to to what you've uh, what you've done and adjust the information accordingly. Um, so, instrument calibration. I think this uh, this can be a big source of error. Certainly, uh, if you were uh, on a on a site, um, you're traveling around, the equipment's been kind of beat up in the back of a truck traveling from wherever you are out to, to a bridge site. Um, there's kind of some simple ways to test um, what the error is, and I think the easiest is a, what they call a two-peg level test. Um, so you set up two rods at a known distance, and you measure um, each rod, you come up with what the elevations are, 
and then you move the rod or you move the instrument to one rod, leave the distance the same, and you measure what the difference is. Um, and the difference, if everything was perfect, it would be the same, but it never ends up that way. So you can get a correction factor. So even if you end up in the field and you've got an error and you find out the instrument's miscalibrated a little bit and you can't fix it, you can compensate for the error that you've got. And this is the easy way to do it. So I'll talk a little bit about actual results. Um, I think this is the stuff that's uh, it's interesting for me because I think when, when I first started, I, I kind, of, kind of missed it, I think is probably the best way to say it. Um, so this is a picture of um, I-35 bridge in uh, Minneapolis. It's kind of the completed structure when we were done. Um, so this is a picture during construction. You notice anything interesting? Yeah, so the cantilever tips, uh, this is a precast concrete segmental bridge, and the tips don't appear to be very close. And like I said earlier, I think that you can kind of be fooled in, in really anything with the, the precision of calculations, engineering calculations. You can convince yourself that I know the capacity of this beam or I know the demand that's on it. But the whole process can be flawed, and you can end up at a point where you're kind of fooling yourself on, on what you're getting. And I think surveying is one of those fields where you can think that the surveyors are using fancy equipment, very precise, and you're going to get really, really perfect results. But in reality, it, it doesn't work that way. Um, in this case, this was perfectly acceptable. There was really no problem. Um, we put a crane out on the one side, and over time, the two kind of deflected and bridges connected. And like you saw in the first picture, it's a perfectly fine bridge. This is another uh, bridge that I worked on in Louisiana when I was hunting all of these concrete towers um, at about 500 feet tall. And again, the, uh, the precision that you have trying to, to build them, um, it's, it's not this class one first order surveying. You, you just, it's, it's far too expensive and it, it, it's not really necessary. The structure can, can live without it. Um, but I think the, the important point is kind of where does it all start? Um, so. That's a, about a 1,600-foot span across the Mississippi River. And it starts with kind of the first pieces that you lay. Um, and I think, uh, you know, Brian worked on a bridge. Uh, where was he in Nicaragua? And El Salvador. And uh, you, you can, as you start to lay out the site and you start to dig foundations and things like that, they're not going to end up exactly where you want. So, like, the more front-end planning you get, as, as you start to build the deck, as you start to build the towers, they may not be square. So kind of the more work you put in the front end, it's, it's, it's good, good insurance. In this case, we started this deck, and the more time we could spend making this deck true and square so that when we shot across the river, we'd meet in the middle, it, it's worth the time and effort. Um, so there's just another photo kind of showing the, the deck progressing along. And when you get that far out, you know, uh, an eighth of an inch here kind of magnifies itself as you get that far out. Um, so th this is some other kind of interesting survey results, I think. So what, what you see on the top two graphs are a profile of um, that bridge deck. And uh, there are, let's see if I can get this nifty pen to work. So here um, in the center are where those towers would be. So you've got kind of the main span meeting in the center there where the, the two graphs are met. And that's the theoretical profile of what the bridge should be. And on top of that, in red, are the actual survey results. So it looks like, okay, wow, that's, that's, that's nearly perfect. The two are, I mean, every point is nearly on top of each other. What you see on the bottom graphs are the deviation from theoretical. So, and if you look at those carefully, you'll see that kind of an order of magnitude, there, there's values two to three inches off from theoretical of what we're supposed to be. And again, the structure is just fine. So it's, it's easy to kind of lure yourself into this fascination that you can get things within millimeters, but the structure may or may not need that. And that's the thing to keep in mind when you're out on a site is take a step back and not get so fine-tuned into, okay, this needs to be within a quarter of an inch and convince yourself that I pulled this tape, I read it twice, I'm a smart guy, this is all going to come out perfect. It's better to take a step back and kind of think, what can go wrong? What are the what are the kind of the big picture things? And make sure that the layout is correct and things are kind of, they feel right when you get done. Because at the end of the day, if bridges like this can survive, 
being off three inches. Most bridges probably can, but you've kind of got to be sure of that. So I think it's worth kind of taking a step back, taking a breather, and, and making sure the information makes sense uh, when you're collecting it. So here's just some other uh, fun stuff from my experience. Uh, so I did a bridge with, uh, with Avery and, uh, and Honduras in a couple years back. Um, this was a, one of the pedestrian bridges that were there, um, kind of driving by, headed to the site. Um, this that was, was rebar, or well, not rebar. That was uh, barbed wire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, fascinating stuff. This was uh, actually our bridge site. Um, so again, we talked about uh, earlier, you know, putting your uh, putting your structure in a in a vehicle path. This was a road they crossed, and we had our bridge just adjacent to there. These are some photos of the deck and fencing installation. This is where our uh, kind of completed towers, com nearly completed bridge. Um, we had uh, we used a post tensioning strand instead of uh, wire rope on that one. We, uh, That's actually, do you mind? So post tensioning strand, um, Matt was on one of two bridge sites that we've ever done using that. And it's really interesting stuff because if you take a cross section of it, it's it's solid, right? So if you think about what um, Brian was talking about with his span, if you take a cross section of wire rope, you've got quite a bit of pore space, and it has an inherent elasticity that it wants to move, go back and forth. So the way Matt's team was able to do the connection at the base of these towers is very different than what Brian had to do, because Matt didn't have to worry about nearly as much stretch is using strand and save so way less movement that's going to happen in the towers from, from stretch. Hmm. So it's something that as an organization we strongly prefer. It's just about um, getting that donated. So. Yeah, it's expensive stuff. I mean, it's, it's, it's what they use in uh, cable state bridges. It's, it's kind of a low stretch material and it's, it's great stuff. It's just expensive and it's hard to come by. It's, it's not something you're going to find in developing countries laying around that someone's just going to give to you. You can probably find used crane cable or stuff like that that kind of has outused its uh, usefulness for, for some people, but useful in other purposes. So, Again, more pictures uh, kind of community celebration when we were opening the bridge. That's it for my piece. Uh, awesome. We uh, head out to the field and uh, start you to play. I, I'm going to do an Avenue level. Yes. yes. Do you have right. any questions for Matthew or surveying? Anything that you didn't remember from your class or stuff that you didn't yeah. never saw before? That's stuff I've never seen before. Thank you. It's <laughs> been a long time. Okay, so I'm going to do the Abney level survey, as promised, very quickly. Um, and we're going to go out in the field mainly with an auto level in mind because I think that that's... Oh, right. Thank you. We're going to go back out to the field with just the auto level. I'm going to have everyone take, uh, take a stab at doing an abney level, especially for if you're doing a project in Rwanda and you want to take survey equipment. This is incredibly practical, very easy, um, it's kind of fun. You still have kind of that feeling like you're playing with a toy. You got them. We've actually passed this around. I'll be talking about it. So. Um, And also one of the things that is under your reading for today, it's not mandatory, but it's a reference, is um, it's a chapter from the textbook, chapter five, on, on ABNY level surveying. And so I thought it might be helpful to see it. What is this? Do we cover contents? Yes. Has anyone used an Abney level before? Yes? Awesome, of course you have. Um, I think they're cool. It's outlined pretty thoroughly in our manual. Uh, volume 2 is Feasibility and Topographic Survey. I went ahead and linked this into the website. So if you guys want a little bit more information, especially if you're considering going out and surveying a bridge, 
everything covered today is covered in much more detail in that manual. As Matthew mentioned, when we're using the omni level, we're essentially just trying to figure the direct distance between wherever you are and wherever the point is you're measuring and that angle. So for obvious reasons, that's only able to give us our angle. We also need to have a tape. So you have to consider the steel tape versus elongating tape. But besides that, it's pretty, pretty easy. You have two sticks of equal height. This, this lady is using some sort of, uh, maybe like a shovel or something, I don't know. But you want to have them the same height from where you're shooting to where you go. So I put my device on top of my little stick, and I'm shooting towards Matthew. His stick, I'm shooting to the top point on the same thing. So as you move across the profile, so as you move across the train and profile, I'm literally, if I could lay on the ground exactly and shoot it and be able to get to the next point exactly on the ground, that would, of course, be ideal. Because then you're just going angle, angle, angle. But that's not practical. The reason you have the stick is to give you clearance above the ground exactly. The way that it works, as Dorothy can show you, as you look through the viewfinder, yes. And out the end, you're going to see as you move the piece with the angle, in the left part of the viewfinder is a bubble. So you're essentially, if you look at it from the side, you're making it so that ang so the bubble, the level is, is parallel to the ground, not at an angle. It's for, from gravity, you want it to be level. But because you're shooting to a point, either up or downhill, you've got to move that until their level is even, and you're looking down or you're looking up. You remove your eye, you look from the side, and it gives you an angle reading. How to read an omni level, of course, is that how many degrees and how many minutes. And then step by step, looking through the viewfinder, the end that's not extendable. So there's every single time I ever use an omni level, I have to check both ends before I figure it out. But unlock the angle protractor so there's a little knob on the side next to the, yep, you want to allow it to swing. Oftentimes, you will also use an abney level in construction surveying. So we want to make sure that our cable is sagged exactly to where we want it to be. At that point in time, we'll talk about using an abney level when you keep it at zero degrees. You don't want it showing you an angle. You want to be able to walk down the hillside to exactly the elevation of where you want that cable to dip to. And you want your abney level to sit there and shoot out and be able to tell you that the cable sag, cable, 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 okay, stop, you're good. So there's both surveying for laying out your bridge, but also construction surveying applications. Once you find that angle, you tighten it up, record in your notebook the angles, degrees, and minutes. And a big thing that I see often is people not indicating if it's negative or plus which for obvious reasons, it's a big difference if you're looking downhill or uphill. Things to think about. And then the reality of what Bridges to Prosperity often uses is we cheat and we go and buy these. This one runs about 230 bucks, but it's for often hunting and golfing, which is awesome. But it gives you the ability not to have to pull a tape I wish I would have told you I was going to talk about this because I have no idea what our tolerance is exactly, but we do this for our preliminary surveys. It's strictly from an efficiency standpoint, but it gets you within a half of a meter, or gets you with a tenth of a meter on distance. I believe the reading um, on the angle is to 10 minutes. So you have obviously some tolerance issues. Is this good enough? Is it not? Um, but when you're just doing your profile, our experience has been that human error induced by those things in your tape and all the measurement changes. This guy's just as great. Regardless, if I'm using a Nikon or if I'm using an Abney level, the key is that you're starting at one point and at every place on that terrain hill that you expect to have a bump or something of interest, you're adding a point and you're shooting to each one. So I'm standing still. Boop, 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 boop. 
And I go to the other side from one of those marks, right on up the back side. Um, we, ha we outlined in the manual how to address error, how to fix and correct for error. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it right now, but it's a very similar kind of ledger. You need to have where is it that you're starting, where are you shooting to? So aligning with the same nomenclature here, if I'm on the right abutment, oftentimes just for my own sake, I'll name it R for my benchmark, da 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 da, -da. You need to know your forward and back angles and observations. And when you get home, you're figuring out what are the horizontal and vertical components of each of those in order to do a plot. So obviously we have what is the distance along that slope line that we don't care about at all. I really want to have the x and y coordinates that align with that. So what we're going to do is um, meet out. Uh, do we decide to meet on the, like right by the entrance, or is that where construction was? I think we can still Okay. So we're thinking we'll give you guys 15 minutes, so if you want to get a coffee and make your way out, it's going to be as you exit the building and you go due east, you go across with the, the funny stoplight they just put in a couple of years ago. It's awkward. Walk past there, past the, build, uh, the parking garage, and it's right before you go underneath the highway, underneath uh, 28. And be there at a quarter to four. Sound good? Are we coming back? Nope, here? not coming back. So take your things, please. It's a horrible day not to drive here. Park down there. <laughs> I'm so mad at this. <laughs>